praise God. I want to wish everyone a blessed Yom Kippur. Remember, we are finishing up our fast today, this wonderful day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the highest holy day in the Jewish calendar. We celebrate a day where the veil is taken away. The Jews believe that there's a window between Rosh Hashanah, which was September the 15th, to now, which ends tomorrow. There's a window of grace. The new year began September the 15th. And this year is on the Jewish calendar, 5784, and the digits add up to 24. This is the year of apocalypse. That, that time of this year, 5784, is a taking away of the veil, apocalypse. It's a day when God and man comes together as in a marriage, a wedding day. And that's why the veil is taken away as when the groom lifts the veil from the bride's face. This year, 5784, this brand new year, that started September the 15th is one of astonishment and shock. It's a time when God will astonish us and shock us. It's a time of judgment and severity. It's a time of anger. And it also has a meaning of shaft, like the shaft that surrounds the grain, and I remember when I was a, a little child and I had to deal with the rice. We called it pick the rice, and we would shake it up to let the shaft blow off and leave the rice. The heaviness of the rice will fall, stay in the sieve, but the shaft would fly away. So this is a time for breaking free where that veil is torn and we break free, the seed will break free from the shaft, from the skin around it. This is a time this year to come out of the world system. It's a year also of the air where we break away from the world system and hear our God's voice. It's a year to break away and hear the year of the door also. And we want in this year to return to the fear of God. When I was preparing this message, I heard the Lord say, tell them, tell my people Return to the fear of the Lord. Return soon, lest I come and smite you and tear you to pieces so there is none to deliver you. It's not too late to get in on the last few hours of our fast. Today, the Day of Atonement, is a day of fasting until sundown tonight. I'm sorry, until sundown Monday night. So we still have a day of prayer. Because atonement starts tonight from sundown and goes through Monday to sundown. 
so you can still get in on that last day of prayer, I want to encourage you, fast. Fast a meal. And use that time to pray and seek God's face so that you can hear his voice, so that you can break through the veil. There is so much going on around us right now. And we want to be like we see in the Bible. The stories of the Old Testament are examples for us so we can understand what God means and we can relate what he's saying in the New Testament by these stories. So we see in the Old Testament the painting on the door with the blood and everyone behind the blood with the doors closed were spared when the death angel passed over. They were dwelling in the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen was spared the plagues as Egypt experienced the plagues. Goshen, which is in Egypt, didn't experience the plagues because they were covered by the blood and before they put the blood on the door, they were covered by the grace of God because they were sons and daughters of God. The same way today, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is greater than the blood of animals. The blood of Jesus is priceless. And so this year, we get to reset we get to start afresh. We get to stop, slow down, and examine, and listen, and return to the fear of the Lord. God reminded me as I was preparing of this scripture, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Ezekiel 2, 7-10. And I want to read it to you. And God told Ezekiel, Speak my words to them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, because they are most rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say unto you. And be not like the rebellious house, open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written there lamentations mourning and woe and it goes on to tell us when he ate it it was bitter and yet it was sweet we need to hear and we need to return to the fear of the Lord and not be rebellious what is the fear of the Lord First, before I share with you what the fear of the Lord is according to the Bible, I want to also tell you God is love. God is a God of love. Agape. 1 John 4, 8 and 16 tells us God is love. God is love. And John 15, 13 tells us, Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay his life down for his friends. 
no greater love. This God who is love demonstrated his love by coming to earth, becoming one of us, and dying on the cross, a sinless, pure, holy God took our sin on the cross, laid in our tomb of sin, went to hell for our sin. Then he rose up again to give us the chance of living a righteous life free of sin. He provided the way for us to be free of that sin by coming again to us as the Holy Spirit living with us, having men write his words for us. So in the Holy Bible, we have a record of who he is what he desires, who he wants us to be, and where he wants us to be in the end. This is the God of love. And for some reason, in these last couple of decades, especially in the last five, three to five years, man has gotten off on this tangent this half-truth that this God of love will not condemn us to hell. And it's only half the truth because he won't condemn us to hell because he's done everything possible to keep us from hell. But the choice is ours. Just like this is the time of the veil, the tearing away of the veil, we as the bride of Christ have got to say before we become covenanted with him, we have to say, I do. We have to say, I do. We have to agree to that covenant. And if we don't agree, then there's nothing. It's not him condemning us to hell. The laws are already set. Like the laws of gravity, they're set. And if you don't abide by the laws of gravity, and you don't have aerodynamics to counteract it for a little bit, then you will fall. You will fall. And the fall, in the end, is all the way down, down, down to hell. So he doesn't condemn us. We have to see that this God of love is a God of righteousness, is a God of judgment also. It's like two sides of a coin. You got the head and you got the tail, the simplest way to explain it. And now we come to the fear of the Lord. God is love. But also, he's a God of judgment. He's a God of terror. Why? The spirit of the fear of the Lord shows us the other side, which is the same God. The other side of this God of love, this word fear, in the spirit of the fear of the Lord, this word fear, the Hebrew is yira. And it means fear, terror, fearing. It means awesome or terrifying it means respect and reverence and piety it means one who's revered this Lord the Hebrew here is Yehovah the exist 
sin one. The proper name of the one true God. So he's a God of love. But he's also El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. He's El Elyon, the Most High God. He's Adonai, Lord and Master. He's Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. He's Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. He's Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. He's Jehovah Tiskanu, the Lord our righteousness. He's Jehovah Makadish, the Lord who sanctifies you. He's Jehovah Elohim, the everlasting God. He's Elohim, God. He's Kana, jealous. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. He's El Gabor, the mighty God. And listen, those are just 16 names. There's over 900 names in the Bible of God. This God, in this time of the tearing of the veil, we need to begin to see God for who he is and not for what our imagination has created him to be. You know, it's like when I was a little girl, I loved to read. I would read anything I get my hands on. In the libraries in Guyana, we could only borrow two books at a time. And maybe you get, I think it was for two weeks. Two books were not enough for me. So what I did was get the library cards of a few family and friends, and I used their card to borrow two books on their card so that I would have a whole slew of books. I would read and read and read. And my aunt Lorraine had a, I don't know if it was hers or where she got it from, but she had, we called it a grip, was one of those suitcases that opened up, um, it's hard, a hard case. And when you opened up, it was filled with Mills and Boons on Harley Quinn romance. And she didn't want me to read it, but I did anyways, because I was, I was hungry for things to read. That was my way of escape. I would sit on the window seat, because you could in my country. You, you sit, it's like this pulpit. The window had a seat on the outside of it, and I would just sit on it. And I would read and read and read. I would read everywhere. My grandmother would give me chores to do, and, and when she comes back, I would sure get it good, because I was reading instead of doing my chores. And those Mills and Boone, reading so many of them, it gave me a false idea of what love between a man and a woman, what love between a, a husband and a wife is. It gave me this idea of someone coming riding my knight on a white horse to rescue me. It didn't tell of all the struggles. And the same way we have of God. Like he's this knight on shining armor. He is. But because he's holy. Because he's pure. Because he's kind of jealous. Because he's our groom. When he's married to us as the bride. He's a jealous God. His marriage is not an open marriage. Where you can go sleep with anybody you feel like, flirt with anybody you feel like. No. When we marry God, when we say I do to Jesus Christ, then we must come under the fear of the Lord to understand we're not our own anymore. We're now His and He's ours. So we need to see the true vision of who God is as he shows us 
in the Bible as the Holy Spirit reveals it. Listen, we are created in God's image. And from the very beginning, he gave us dominion as a result. Because we're in his image as this great almighty God. Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of angel armies, he's the Lord of hosts. This is the God we serve. This is the God whose image we're created in. And because we're created in this great image, then we must come under him. Because if we don't come under the almighty God, then we become like Satan, who was thrown out of heaven, who refused to come under God, who decided he had to be God. He had to get the glory God was getting. God will not share his glory with anyone. So Satan was kicked out. And it's only a short while before he's put in hell that was created for him and the angels who followed him out of heaven who are now his demons. If we don't come under the hand of this mighty God who he created us to be will end up destroying us. We were not created to be without God. We were not created to be. It's like this computer or even the TV right now it's plugged in it's plugged in with a cord even this device that I'm recording on we're plugged in hi Pauline hi Lydia good morning we're plugged in with this cord if I leave my computer unplugged and running. If I leave my tablet unplugged and running, then eventually it will die because it needs a source of power. The TV can't even come on without this source. My tablet can run for a little while, maybe an hour or two, maybe longer, my computer will run for several hours without being plugged in. The TV cannot. And that's who we are. We must be plugged into Christ. He tells us plainly in John chapter 15, he says, I'm the main branch. My father is the husbandman. He says, you are the branches. I'm the main vine. You are the branches. He said, if the branch does not abide in me, the vine, he is nothing and will be cast into the fire. So we've got to return to the fear of the Lord. The f lack of the fear of the Lord has caused us to be on plugged from our maker, from our God. And as a result, there's chaos. Here's the sad part of it. Like this computer, when I unplug it, I can work on it for hours. I can work on my computer for hours without it being plugged in. And that's what's happening to too many of us. We're still surviving. We're still existing, not being plugged in to Christ. And so because of it, we think we're okay. We're not. This is the time to examine ourselves. This is the time to understand we cannot operate apart from the fear of God. Now, there, you, you got to understand there are two spirits of fear. There's a spirit that's always the counterfeit. Listen. Satan always counterfeits because remember, his goal is to be God. So whatever God does, look for the counterfeit. If God makes a promise to you, 
expect the counterfeit to show up. And that's why you need to know God and be plugged into him so you can recognize the counterfeit. There's a spirit of fear that God did not give to us. It tells us that in in 2 Timothy 1, 7, God did not give us the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear from Satan brings torment because it causes us to lose the true fear of God and instead we develop an unhealthy, crippling fear. I'm not talking about that fear. You know it if it makes you feel condemned. And that's where you plug in. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ to walk in the Spirit. So if it makes you condemned, it's the wrong fear. If it makes you feel afraid, if it makes you feel hopeless, it's the wrong fear. Romans, and there you go, you plug in again, and it says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, nothing. So we need to plug in to God, and we do it through understanding his awe, understanding and respect and reverencing him as a God who could just look at us, who could just point his finger, who could just say one word and we can drop dead. But his love chooses not to. His love chooses to give us chances. And this is such a time. The Jews call it, this is the alarm clock to wake up. Wake up. Where are you with God? Where are you with God? He's coming any minute. Are you there? Are you ready? And if you are, are you actively praying for your family? I think just a couple of days ago, I put another list on my bathroom mirror with the scripture, Hebrews 1 13, well, 13 and 14, I put 14, I wrote it out, that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are ears of salvation. They're sent forth to minister to those who shall be ears of salvation. So I put that scripture up. And I think it's Psalm 80 that says that they'll beat the enemy like a sh- like shaft. The same shaft that this year means where it breaks the seed away from the skin so the seed can be set free. And I've got names up there. And so every time I go in the bathroom, day and night, I can see it. And I can say, God, send your ministering angels forth. Send them forth to minister to this one, this one, this one. And I want to challenge you today to do that. For those in your bloodline, those who are related to you by blood, who are not saved, not the ones who are going to church. Just because you're in the car doesn't make you, I'm sorry, in the garage doesn't make you a car. Just because somebody goes to church doesn't make them saved. Just because somebody claims they know scriptures or they sing songs does not mean they are saved. When you are saved, there's fruit that is produced as a result. Are they producing that fruit? If they're not saved, put their names on the mirror and every day go in there or or on the refrigerator and Pray every day. Listen, time's running out. There's a window of opportunity. This time of awe, the apocalypse, it lines up with Revelation, where Revelation shows what happens when Christ 
calls us in the rapture. And then when he splits the eastern skies and puts his feet on the mountain, and everything that will ensue during that time. So this is the time when it could happen. This is the hour when the Jews expect the return of Christ. When they expect it started with the sound of the trumpet, which is what we'll hear at the rapture, and it ends tomorrow with a long blast of the trumpet again. It's likened to a Jewish wedding when the man comes and asks the parent's hand of this girl, and if she agrees, then he gives her a token, and that token says, we are covenanted together I'm going away for a year to build a place for you and when that time is up and my place is ready and you've got to understand in that time that young man him building that place wasn't proclaimed ready until his father said it was ready that's how close-knitted they were. That was the culture. It's the same culture of the Spirit. The Lord will look at his Son. God will look at the Son and say, Son, it's ready. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, I go, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He says, but I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's ready, I come and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you will also be. That's the language of the wedding, of the groom and the bride of the betrothal, and that's where we are right now. So, the groom went away, like Jesus has, to prepare a place for us. And when the groom is ready, normally he builds rooms attached to his father's house. That's for his bride and him and his family. When all that's ready, the father will examine it, pronounce it ready, and tell the son, it's time to go get your bride. He will come with his grooms. His grooms will go ahead of him. And as they enter the city where the bride lives, the grooms will blow on a horn. And they will proclaim, make room for the bride. I'm sorry, make room for the groom. Behold. The bridegroom cometh. Make room. Make room. In the meantime, the girl, she has to be ready. She has to have all her stuff ready. That when she hears that sound, that she grabs her stuff with her maids, and there goes the ten virgins again. She has to be ready with everything that she needs, oil in her lamp. Because listen, when the bridegroom comes, he does not stop. He keeps moving. Because if he doesn't see the bride coming out, then he keeps going because he assumes she's changed her mind. So she's got to move quickly. And that's why it says in a twinkling of an eye, in a twinkling of an eye, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, in the twinkling of an eye, you'll rise up to meet him. You'll change, will change this outer garment for new heavenly garments. And so the bride had to be ready, her and her maids, to run out. Her maids were virgins. 
and they have to be ready to run out and join the groom party. And so this is the time. Are we in the fear of the Lord? What does it mean to be in the fear of the Lord so we can be ready? That bride, during that time that our groom was gone, had to prepare herself for her new life that's coming. She doesn't live life of frolicking. She doesn't go sleep with anybody else because she's just as good as married without the sexual consummation. But too many of us, we are betrothed to Jesus, but we're committing adultery. We've got idols everywhere, and we're doing our own thing. So this is the time for us to examine ourselves, for us to pull the veil back, for us to hear from God, what is the what is the fear of the Lord? We're going to look first in Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, and we want to see that the fear of the Lord is the spirit of the Lord. So here in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, it's talking about Jesus, this rod this of Jesse that will arise. And it says in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and and of the fear of the Lord. We see the fear of the Lord is the spirit of the Lord. And that's what Jesus says. No one can confess that he's God, that he's Lord, unless the Father gives him that confession, unless the Spirit moves in him. We need the grace of God to say, I do to God. We need the fear of the Lord, which is given to us by God himself. So the fear of the Lord is a spirit of God. The next thing I want to show you is that the fear of the Lord is an action of the spirit. It's a spirit, but it's also action. And it reminds me this morning when I got up to pray at 5 o'clock. I went, I, this scripture came to my mind, so I looked it up. I know it was in, it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but I couldn't remember where. I was, as I was praying, this is what I wanted. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And I'm going to read that. I had to pick up my Bible. I forgot to pick it up from out of my bag. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over every hindering spirit. Those that come to distract and disrupt. I curse your works right now in Jesus' name. And command that every arrow, every altar risen up right now, be consumed by the fire of God and become null and void. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, I want to show you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 says, and, we, and, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So I was, as I was praying this morning, asking the Lord that as I spoke this morning, it wouldn't just be words. I remember this scripture and turned to it and read it, and I'm reading it to you now. It says, our speech would not be 
in the enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, man finds ways to seduce you, to pull you in. Like the scams. Oh, there's so many scams right now. I was watching one popped up on my feed where this widow was robbed of $160,000 and couldn't get it back because the police, the I'm sorry, the bank said, you authorized him to take that money. They scammed her, and you have to be careful. A text came in that says, this is your bank, and your account some of them say your account is compromised. Her says, did you authorize this $35? If you did or didn't, I can't remember which one it was, click on this link. If your bank sends you a note that something has happened, do not click a link. Pick up the phone. Call the bank and talk to somebody. She didn't do that. She clicked on the link. And the person said, well, I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, you need to give me your account number. So she did. You need to give me your PIN. So she did. And over a period of a couple of days, they keep saying, I'm so sorry. We're still having difficulty refunding you this $35. And they keep asking her for more and more. Eventually, when she finally go down to the bank, this is Chase. They said to her, well, you've had a lot of activity on your account in these past couple of days. They showed her the activity. Some was $45,000 pulled out at one time. They cleared her of everything, $160,000. And now she owed the bank $800. They were able to go over what she had. So she owed the bank $800. And this is a retiree. And now they're telling her, we can't give it back to you because you authorized them to do this. So man has enticing words these days. Never seen so much scams. Never. So our words are not enticing words of man's wisdom. But note, underline that. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. In demonstration of the spirit and of power. Demonstration of the spirit and power. And so this is what I want to tell you about the Spirit. The Spirit, the fear of the Lord, is not only a Spirit, but it's action. He demonstrates. He manifests. We see in the Old Testament, He manifested by falling on the people. We see in 1 Samuel 11, 7, I'm not going to read the story. The story was about the man whose concubine was raped by the people of this one tongue. So he hacked her up and sent pieces to every one of the towns of his brethren to say, Come out and fight for me against this city because this is what they did to my concubine. And it says, the fear of the Lord fell on the people. The fear of the Lord fell on the people when they saw that piece of this human and they all came out with one consent to fight against this evil that was done. One person murdered. Cities came out to fight this one city that allowed it to happen or that it happened in. 
I want to show you another story in 2 Samuel 14. And this is King Asa. And it said, King Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears, 300,000 out of Judah, that, and then out of Benjamin, 200, over 200,000. And they were mighty men of valor. So he had this great army. But in verse 9, it says, Zerah the Ethiopian came out against him, and he had thousand, thousand, and three hundred chariots. He had a thousand, thousand. What's a thousand, thousand? That's a million. And he came out against Asa. And Asa went out to battle him. And notice the amount of army he has. Over, just over 500,000. So, Zerah has double that. And so in verse 11, Asa did what we need to do. He had the fear of the Lord in him. He recognized the power and the authority of God. He could recognize the awesomeness of God. And he said, Lord. It said he cried out unto the Lord his God and said, Lord. And I want you to hear this and underline it. Verse 11 of Second Chronicles 14. He says, Lord, it is nothing with you to help whether with many or with them that have no power this is the fear of the Lord he recognized the awesomeness of this terrible God here comes this man from Ethiopia with a million chariots a million chariots that means if he has a million chariots He's got foot soldiers also, and he's got men on horses. And Asa only has 500,000 men, not chariots. It is nothing with you to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. And we think of Gideon, how 300 men Defeating an army because of God's power, God's demonstration of power. He says, help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. I want you to understand, though we are created in his image, this mighty, awesome God, and though we have dominion given by this mighty, awesome God, we must come under him we must recognize that our power our authority is sourced from him and him alone so he says we rest on me god and in your name we go against this multitude we this little army of just half a million people Compared to this, his million chariots, therefore so many other people, we rest on you, God, and in your name we go. Because you are our God. Let no man prevail against you. He's saying they're coming to fight us, but they're not fighting us. They're fighting you, God. Don't let them prevail against you. And it says in verse 12, The Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued him, and they destroyed all of them. But listen to this. It says that as a result, 
all the cities around them, the fear of the Lord came upon them. And that's how we should live. We should live so much in the fear of the Lord. We're not. We're not living in the fear of the Lord when we're going to see Beyonce's concert. We're not living in the fear of the Lord when we're shacking up with a man we're not married to or a woman we're not married to. We're not living in the fear of the Lord when we allow our children to live like hell, acting like hell in the classroom. And instead of disciplining them, we're cussing the teacher out. And we call ourselves Christians. No. We're not living in the fear of the Lord when we don't read our Bibles, when we don't pray, when we don't obey what God says. The Bible says they had exceeding spoils and the fear of the Lord came upon all the people around them. I love this scripture, Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Listen to this. When your ways please the Lord, how will your ways please the Lord? There are things, I call them weapons in the Bible. I call them treasures. I call them secrets. And every year it seems I get different ones. There was a year, I think up to last year, one of the secret weapons I got is John 5.19 and John 5.30. And it says this, Jesus is speaking and he says, I do nothing unless I see my father do it. And he says, I make no judgments. I do not speak about a thing unless I hear my father judge it. And then he said in John 8, 29, he says, I do always please my father. He says, my father is with me always because I do always please him. And my prayer was, may I always please you like Jesus did. May I only do those things that I see you do. May I only make judgments according to what I hear you say. We can't do that. Unless we're under the fear of the Lord. We recognize that it's only God that can give us the answers. I was watching a little show. And in the show, two, two young men, one, his mother advised him, only do what the Holy Spirit says. And he had a dream. And in the dream, and I'm just telling you this story to illustrate what I'm saying. In the dream, he dreamt that he would get a job, but the job was not in his field. It was very menial. He was going to be a courier. He was going to be taking messages for the company to different places that they wanted it to go. He was going to carry it, the courier, whereas he was a computer engineer, very skilled in computer systems. But that's the job he would get. His friend, on the other hand, refused anything menial. And when he saw him and heard that that's the job that his friend was doing, this menial job, he laughed him to scorn. He laughed and he laughed. But these are the words he said. He said, the Holy Spirit told me not to take this job. I'm getting $15,000 a month. I'm getting a company car. I'm getting a house. The Holy Spirit told me not to take it, but I used wisdom and I took it because I'm not passing up that much. Now remember, the Holy Spirit told the other one, take the menial job. You know, in the end it showed, and this will happen, this will happen when we decide we're God and we live in our fear and our enticing wisdom or man's wisdom 
When we live like that, we will fall. What he didn't know, the reason why the Holy Spirit told him not to take the job was because this company was embezzling and was about to go bankrupt. And they needed a fall guy. And they used him, the newbie, as the fall guy. So now he's in jail. Why? He disobeyed the spirit that can see everything. When your ways please the Lord, he makes even your enemies be at peace with you. Whereas the next one in the company that he worked in, he worked so diligently, he worked so systematically, he worked so intelligently, but he worked so morally that the boss saw, observed for a whole year. And he said, why is this guy like this? And he tested him. He says, I need you to falsify these documents for me. Which is what the other one did. He falsified documents that put him in jail. This young man said, no, I can't do it. I will not disgrace my father, God. I will not do it. And the guy says, well, you can lose your job. He said, well, I'd rather do that. When your ways please the Lord, he will make even your enemies be at peace with you. I want to look quickly at another person, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 17.10, it says, The fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms round about the land so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. And remember, Jehoshaphat is the one who said to the Lord, We have no might and no power. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He recognized the fear of the Lord. And the Bible says, as we come to the end of the message, I'll do part two next week. The Bible says in Second Chronicles 19 verse 1, that as a result, of the victory that God gave him, there was peace around. And in verse 5 of Second Chronicles 19, it said, He said, Judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. But this is what he said to the judges. And I want to end with this. Take heed what you do. For you are not judging for man. You're judging for the Lord. The Lord who is with you in judgment. Therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. And take heed. Do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. Nor there is no respecter of persons. Nor taking of gifts. And in verse 9, he told them again. It says, he charged them saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord. You shall judge. All your judgments should be in the fear of the Lord. Faithfully and with a perfect heart. So justice happens when we walk in the fear of the Lord. And never in a day. Have we needed the fear of the Lord like we need it today in our American courts, upon our judges? Never before have we needed it for justice. Next week, I continue this message imploring you to return to the fear of the Lord and quickly. Let's do it quickly. 
The window of time is running out. Any minute now, the bridegroom is going to come. His father is going to look at him and says, Son, the houses are ready. The mansions are built. It's time. Go get my children. And that trumpet will sound as the angels, the groom's men, sound out. Behold, the bridegroom come. And that's why it says, and I've got on the wall in, in the church, surely I come quickly, Jesus says. And the bride says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Is that your heart's cry today? Is your heart's cry, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because you know you're ready, but you're sick and tired of what's going on around you. That should be our heart's cry today. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And as a result, we're praying for our families. So I'm challenging you as I close, as I close this message today, part one, to return to the fear of the Lord and quickly. As I close this message, I want to challenge you again on the Day of Atonement, which begins tonight and ends tomorrow, Monday, at midnight, sorry, after sundown, where did I get midnight from? At sundown, I want to encourage you, fast the meal, take, take an hour to fast and pray. Fast your lunch and pray and hear from God. Let him remove the veil. Let him show you his sweet face. Let him remove your veil so you can see his sweet face. Let him remove the veil from your heart. At this time, also pray for Israel. The Bible says, when the veil of their heart is taken away, they'll see the truth. So I want to end by challenging you, not only to fast a meal tomorrow, Monday, the Day of Atonement, September the 25th, but to get a piece of paper out and name your blood relatives who are yet unsaved, who are not ready for the coming of the Lord, who are not ready for the call of the bridegroom, who's, got, who's maybe got no oil in their lamp. Put their names down. Write the scripture out. Hebrews 1, 14. And ask the Lord. Every time you go see it, ask the Lord. Send the angels after my family. Call them out before the Lord. Send the angels after them. Amen? I want to speak over you today. I decree and declare over you today. In the name of Jesus. The year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord. Beginning this September 2023 and goes to the beginning of September 2024, I decree that this year you will see astonishment and shock for the good things God will do for you. And while others are struggling because of their disobedience, you, for your obedience, I decree and declare, will be as if you're living in Goshen. You'll see that everything that you need is supplied for you, even in famine. I decree and declare over you the blessings of the Lord that make it rich and add no sorrow. I decree and declare over you your prodigals are returning home. I decree and declare over you the things that you've been struggling with for too long right now dries up and come to an end. I decree and declare over you that any altars that have been built 
back to the third and fourth generation of rebelliousness in a family of incest and the results of it, of lack and poverty, of families that have gone in and stolen from others, and now you are seeing the effects of it. I decree and declare all those covenants broken, those marriages divorced in the spirit world, those altars built be consumed by God's fire in the name of Jesus. And every debt that the devil claims that you owe paid in full because of sonship, because you have an account in heaven. And if not, because of the mercies of God, that every debt is paid in full and that angels are dispatched immediately to your territory, around the perimeters of your home, draw a bloodline around it, and deliver restraining orders to the enemy that he cannot come up on your property. Every disease in your body, every dis-ease in your body, I decree and declare by the stripes of Jesus is reversed. In the name of Jesus, every debt against you, I decree and declare, will be supernaturally paid. I decree and declare over you that every judgment against you is reversed because of sonship, because of the blood. I decree and declare over you the fear of the Lord falling. I decree and declare a falling of the spirit of the fear of the Lord upon you and upon your household, that from this day forward, that fear and awe of the Lord will cause you to worship from your spirit in a way that will cause you to be faithful to your husband, Jesus Christ, who you said, I do too. I decree and declare faithfulness that from this day, you'll begin to see a turnaround. And as the last full moon comes up, I think in a week or so, I decree and declare it will be a sign to you. You will receive a sign that the rivers have been turned for you. That the waters of heaven have flowed over you, that God has ridden on the floods to your aid, you'll begin to see changes that will keep happening. And the only condition is that you continue in the fear of the Lord, learning what your bridegroom wants, what he likes, and learning to please him. I decree and declare it over you. I decree the day of vengeance of our God over you. In the name of Jesus. And so I praise God for you today. And I pray that there's spirit and demonstration over you. A demonstration of the spirit and power over you beginning right now in Jesus' name tangible, tangible. You can see it and feel the difference that begins to happen as the Lord arises upon you and as you arise in turn in faithfulness to the Lord. Amen? So God bless you. Bless you. This is life. This is power. Jesus told the people in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, you do error. You are in error because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Don't let it be said of you that you don't know these scriptures and you don't know the power of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, who's fully God, his job is to teach you what thus says the Lord because this is who God is. Amen? God bless you. Rise up and stand like never before. Any minute now, he'll come 
But before he comes, he wants to show you glory so others can see it and be drawn in. God bless you. Should he say the same next Sunday, I'll continue part two, and I'll talk with you Thursday. God bless you. I love you.